A man fills many roles in his lifetime. Provider, protector, master of the house. As a father, you have a vital role in your family's life. They depend on you to be there. We help to make sure you can fulfill that promise because, no matter what they call you, at the end of the day, you know you're just dead. Confederate Family Insurance, for over 100 years, protecting a people and their property. You're watching Channel 6, San Francisco, the city by the bay, Confederate television. Tonight, the most anxiously awaited television event of the decade. See the controversial film from Britain that shook our beloved nation and created a national scandal. In response to popular demand, it will be shown tonight, uncensored and in its entirety. Held from the American airwaves for nearly two years, CSA is next. From the very beginning, it was deadly serious. This was no interim idea or experiment. The principal founding fathers were all Southern. They saw themselves in the best tradition of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. In their eyes, they would lead a second American Revolution. See, Bobby, the richest Americans were concentrated in the South. But, Mr. Johnson, the North had significant industry. Wouldn't they have been wealthier? Remember, Bobby, cotton was America's number one export. This made Southerners, as well as Northern textile mills, very wealthy. So cotton was king. Boy, howdy. Slaves must have been pretty important then, huh? And how? By 1860, a young prime field hand would sell for as much as a luxury car would today. Cheapers. American slaves represented more capital than any other asset in the entire nation. Golly, Mr. Johnson, America was always a slave-based economy. That's right, Bobby. And that's why we fought for it. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. What I do about slavery and the colored race, I do because I believe it helps to save the Union. Abraham Lincoln. By January of 1861, most people in the American South believed the election of Republican President Abraham Lincoln would terminate their ownership of Negroes. A provisional government was formed, and Jefferson Davis of Mississippi was elected president. The new seal of the Confederacy expressed the vision of the young nation. Surrounded by a bountiful agricultural Eden, at its center is George Washington on horseback. Washington, a Virginian and slaveholder, would become the father of the Confederacy. In very little time, the Confederacy defined itself as an independent, sovereign nation. One man from Virginia remarked 
hell fire. If I'd known it was gonna be that easy, I'd cut loose from the Yankee years ago. Meanwhile, the Union victory at Antietam gave President Lincoln the opportunity to make a revolutionary proclamation. I do order and declare that all persons held as slaves within said designated states and parts of states are and henceforward shall be free. Freedom. The proclamation did not free a single slave. It was purely symbolic and used by Lincoln to frame the war in moral intent. President Davis countered so-called emancipation by sending Judah P. Benjamin to negotiate the military and financial involvement of the foreign powers Britain and France. Benjamin, a Jew and the South's most brilliant legal mind, defied anti-Semitic attitudes to become Secretary of State and President Davis' chief advisor. Benjamin matched Lincoln by wisely promoting the Southern cause of states' rights, not as the preservation of slavery, but as the freedom of private property. Benjamin's gambit worked. Fighting for freedom, not slavery, opened the avenue for Europe's entrance into the war. With the assistance of several divisions of British and French troops, Lee's armies at Gettysburg routed the Union forces. When those Federal soldiers saw those French and British troops moving up on line on either side of Lee's flanks, many of them just broke and ran. And in a matter of months, Southern troops took the nation's capital, capturing the White House. But there was no sign of President Lincoln. In a small house outside Washington, D.C., on April the 9th, 1864, General Ulysses S. Grant surrendered to General Robert E. Lee. The bloody conflict had finally ended. It became the primary objective of Confederate forces to locate and arrest the now deposed President Lincoln. Confederate forces were everywhere. A desperate Lincoln turned to Harriet Tubman. Tubman, wanted with a huge bounty on her head, would be the last resort for a president literally running for his life. Tubman's Underground Railroad was a series of way stations that organized the escape of over 200 slaves out of the United States to freedom. But her dearest passenger would require Tubman's most ingenious plan to date. She chose to disguise President Lincoln in blackface and travel with him along one of her many secret slave routes. When Lincoln scoffed at the plan, Tubman, never one to mince words, reminded him of the huge bounty on his head. She said simply, We're both niggers now, Mr. President. A crack battalion of Confederate troops was dispatched from Detroit to locate and arrest Lincoln and Tubman before they could escape into Canada. Lincoln and Tubman were captured trying to cross Lake St. Clair. President Abraham Lincoln was now a prisoner of the Confederate Army. In 1915, the capture of Lincoln was also dramatized in D.W. Griffith's silent film classic, The Hunt for Dishonest Abe.
Jefferson Davis, on learning of Mr. Lincoln's capture and blackface, termed the arrest symbolic. A quick trial was convened, and former President Lincoln was convicted of war crimes against the Southern nation. He was imprisoned in Fortress Monroe, near Norfolk, Virginia. It was from the window of his damp cell that he watched the execution of the woman who run away slaves called Moses. Tubman knew on her capture that she would be executed for her many crimes against the South. I'd rather die fighting to free others from this evil nation than live within it another minute as a slave. There were many who were clamoring for Mr. Lincoln's execution also, but, but President Davis understood that sparing Lincoln's life would ease tensions in the North. A wise man, he was already looking to the future. After serving two years, a frail and gaunt Lincoln was granted a full pardon and exiled to Canada. He never returned to his homeland. In June 1905, shortly before his death, he granted a rare interview from Montreal. I fail to see it. The abolitionists understood what the consequences would be. They knew it was always about the Negro, but I was blind. Now I see, I see what our once great country has become. I only wish that I had truly cared for the Negro, truly cared for his freedom, for his equality. I used him, now I am used. Now I too am a Negro, without a country. I pray that someday the colored people of Confederate America will be free. A nation stained with the blood of injustice cannot stand. I only regret that I shall not live to see it fall. When Mr. Lincoln died in exile in Canada, he was a lonely, bitter man, disgraced, abandoned, almost entirely forgotten by history. Today, he's only remembered as the man who lost the War of Northern Aggression. I'm so tired of eating dust. I've tried everything and nothing works. Is there anything that can make this car faster? Try some of this, sport. Do Cooter! Sambo X-15 is specially formulated for the way America drives. It blasts and cleans away those stubborn black deposits that rob your engine of power. It lubricates and protects. Listen to her purr. Thanks, Duke. Don't thank me. Thank Sambo X-15. It's what the pros use. When may I expect an interview? Presently, Mr. Herrick. Presently. What would the noontime be without the classic Leave it to Beulah? Beulah, who's always in the kitchen. But never seems to know what's cooking. Weekdays at noon. The victory was cause for grand celebration. Plantations throughout the South were the center of jubilant parties welcoming back the troops, returning them to a now blessed and triumphant way of life. With the stroke of a pen, President Davis annexes the United States. The symbols of the old government are removed. It becomes the Confederate States of America. Dixie, a former minstrel show tune, written ironically by a Northerner, replaces the national anthem. President Davis quickly left Richmond and moved the office of the presidency to Washington and the White House. But two problems would follow. We were surrounded. He said, lay down your arms, and go back to your plantations or die. My wives, children, all of us would say fight. 
revs come at us in waves, screaming like they do. Our ammunition gone, they slaughtered us. Women, children, didn't matter. He spared me and my family. He said to me, my name is Colonel Nathan Bedford Forrest, and your nigger soul shall live to testify our superiority. Then they shot my wife and boy, Moses Butler, First Kansas Volunteers. They looked to the generals and asked why. Why was it necessary to burn and pillage? Uh, they remember the once beautiful New York City, the historic Boston, Massachusetts. They see them in ruin and wonder why. Yet, during the war, those same people demanded, win, conquer, kill the Yankees. <laughs> Nothing good will ever come of war. War is hell. General Robert E. Lee. The fate of millions of black slaves seemed settled when a surprising call for emancipation arose from an even more surprising source. I again assert that Virginia and the South as a whole would fare better if she could get rid of the Negro population. They would be a cause of serious trouble in our attempt to hold them. Lee would cause a firestorm of debate over what to do with the post-war slaves. A dashing freshman congressman from Virginia would take the floor and establish himself as the leader of the pro-slavery position. It is said that John Ambrose Fauntroy could persuade any colleague from his position or charm any woman from her dress. We have always known that the Honorable General Lee was a secret emancipationist. However, the noble gentleman knows more of military matters than civil affairs. Dear friends, the colored is not ready for freedom. To free him is to make him an orphan. Liberty would be a great curse to the race. Congressman John Ambrose Fauntroy, 1865. President Davis, however, approached the question from a practical point of view. Davis was having one of his many sleepless nights. He was down in the kitchen with Marina, his wife, when his faithful servant, old Popsy, brought him a cup of hot coffee. And over that cup of coffee, they would alter the course of history. The moment was captured in the 1946 RKO film, The Jefferson Davis Story. The role of Popsy is played by the renowned Shakespearean actor, Sir Frederick Littlefield. Come to bed, Jefferson. You haven't slept all night. How can I sleep, Marina? I must find a way to unite this country. <laughs> I heard Miss Marina stirring. I knew you were up again. Lord, sir, what am I going to do with you? Jefferson, you've tried so. Don't make yourself ill. Mm-hmm. You sure enough have, sir. You've done all a man can do, sir. I know, I know, but I must find a way to bring the North into our way of life. If I don't, it may spell disaster. Master President, may an old no-count darkie like me ask a question, sir? Yes, what is it, Popsy? Well, Master President, I heard folks say back long ago that their northern folks had slaves. Yes, they did, Popsy, uh, years ago. Well, Master, supposing, just supposing now, they owned them again, just like in the old days. It was good to him once, might be good to him again. My God. That's it. Ironically, it was the old slave who gave President Davis the notion that would rejuvenate the institution of slavery and direct the country's path for centuries to come. The Davis plan took the form of an income tax designed to rebuild the North. Still, Former Unionists did have another option. 
the entire tax collected only from former Union citizens could be abated with the purchase of household or industrial slaves. The choice was yours. To manage the plan, Davis selected Congressman John Ambrose Fauntroy. We spoke with the congressman's great-grandson, John Ambrose Fauntroy V, the Democratic nominee for president at his Washington, D.C. campaign headquarters. Horace, come on, yeah, Lindsay? Yeah. yeah. Horace's family uh, has been with our family, oh, geez, for uh, how many generations now? Since the beginning, sir. Yeah. He's like family to us. A pleasure meeting you, Horace. Yeah. Great-grandfather, he, uh, oh, he welcomed the appointment. See, he was a, a student of human nature, so he, well, he easily predicted the choice that the Northerners would make, and, uh, well, he was humored by the sudden moral confusion of the abolitionists. He called the whole thing a, a giant garden party for the nation. Stray Negroes, free and slave, children, the elderly, or anyone with dark skin who could not prove Caucasian ancestry were arrested and placed in cattle pens in most major northern cities. Former southern owners travelled for hundreds of miles to sort through the thousands of black faces and claim their escaped property. Most perplexed about their fate under the plan were those of mixed racial background. A small number of so-called mulatto slave owners existed in South Carolina and other southern states. Formerly called freemen of colour, under the Davis plan, the one-drop statute constituted their inclusion to the breed. Mixed-race slaveholders were sold right along with their full-blooded slaves. As one slave put it, light, bright, damn show sure ain't white. Abolitionists rallied to combat the Davis plan. Walt Whitman penned this protest in the Brooklyn Eagle. Slavery is a good thing to the rich, the one out of thousands but it is destructive to the dignity and independence of all who work and to labor itself. But Fauntroy countered. We are immigrants from different countries, different backgrounds, different languages. Only one tie holds us all together, our white ancestry. This slavery is afforded not just for the rich, but for every man according to his color. I wish to God every head of a family in this great land had one slave to take the drudgery and menial service off the family. Northerners began to appreciate what Southerners had always known. It's good to be the master. A secret meeting was held in the home of Susan B. Anthony to respond to the success of the Davis plan. There, William Lloyd Garrison read his now famous letter, Why We Must Leave. We are living under a brutal slave oligarchy that now threatens to starve us if we do not do their evil bidding. Will I make a compact with the slaveholder, the man who plunders, cradles, scourges women with the lash till the soil is red with blood? Never, my dear friends. Simply, we must leave. About 20,000 whites, mostly northerners, followed Garrison across the border to Canada. Among the notable expatriates were Harriet Beecher Stowe, Henry David Thoreau, Mark Twain, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and the outspoken Wendell Phillips. It does not surprise me that the North has taken to this monstrous plan. There were always just a few true abolitionists, for if the North were ever against slavery, it would not have lasted these many years. Another to leave was the suffragette Susan B. Anthony. Anthony would lead a women's movement in Canada, gaining the vote for women in 1912. One particular incident that really got the attention of the country was the matter of Cassie Brown in 1875. Cassie was a slave woman who brutally murdered the three white children in a charge and escaped and she was never captured. It hurts me to my soul that I took them children's lives. I loved them children, I swear I did. I had me three children once ago. They was took off and sold from me. Them white babies wasn't my children. 
and I wasn't named Mama. No woman can be Mama who ain't free. Cassie Bryant, 1875. For the first time, people began to wonder, could they trust their black mammy? Slave owners, left befuddled at the behavior of their beloved slaves, turned to Dr. Samuel A. Cartwright of the University of Louisiana, a highly respected and widely published member of the American Medical Association. Cartwright, considered an expert on Negro diseases and peculiarities, had made a major breakthrough with his discovery of drapetomania. Draptomania is a disease which causes slaves to run away, from the Latin drapto, meaning to flee, and mania, an obsession. Thus, Dr. Cartwright believed draptomania to be the root cause of all runaways. Amazingly, his research would influence an entire generation of medical thought. A slave is like a child and should be treated with care. However, when a slave becomes sulky or dissatisfied, then I prescribe whipping the devil out. Dr. Samuel A. Cartwright, 1870. John Ambrose Fauntroy, who many call the father of modern slavery, received the Democratic presidential nomination in 1880, but suffered a debilitating stroke weeks later. He died in 1882. The Fauntroy family would capture the imagination of the nation for years to come. A political dynasty, many consider the talented family American royalty. I wanted a career working firsthand with doctors in a professional setting that didn't take four long years. I wanted to help all God's creatures great and small, but my grades just weren't high enough for medical school. But now, I'm on the fast track to success. Train for a new and exciting career at CI, the Cartwright Institute for the Study of Freedom Illnesses. In just months, not years, CI can train you for a rewarding career as an overseer, patty roller, servant monitor, breeder, or get an associate's degree in e-slave accounting. Perform medical experiments. Learn the nature of freedom diseases. You'll be proud working firsthand with doctors, tackling the challenges of Negro peculiarities. Become that person you always knew you could be. Call CI today. Classes are forming, so call right now. Run for run for the battle will get you. Run for run for the sound boss play. What you gonna do? What you gonna do? What you gonna do when we find you? What you gonna do? What you gonna do? What you gonna do when we find you? Run for run for the battle will get you. Run for run for you gotta get away. Run for run for the battle will get you. Run for run for the sound boss play. What you gonna do? What you gonna do? What you gonna do when we find you? What you gonna do? What you gonna do? What you gonna do when we find you? Run for run. Runaway tonight at 10.30. While the Davis plan rebuilt the cities, a psychological reconstruction would be instrumental in giving birth to a new nation. Confederate leaders knew it was necessary to reconstruct the minds of its slaves and citizens. This would become what some call the American Holocaust. Reconstruction would see to it that moral authority was reestablished. Many called it gentle reminder. Douglas and Garrison responded to these horrors by organizing fugitive slaves, free blacks, Canadians, and former US citizens into a new organization, the NAACP the National Association for the Advancement of Chattel People. A Confederate delegation met with Prime Minister Sir John A. Macdonald and demanded the immediate return of all Negro property located within the Canadian Territory. These were the darkest days since the overturning of emancipation. In the final hour, Frederick Douglass was called before Parliament to speak. Gentlemen, 
The Negro is only a darker version of yourself. He has little to offer but the sweat of his brow, the culture of his soul, and his goodwill. The Negro's only demand is freedom. My dear brothers, stand with us in our fight for freedom. The oratory of Douglas swayed the needed votes against deportation. However, the executions and tortures had scared most slaves into submission. Until the very end, until his death in 1895, Douglas fought against slavery in the former United States. Yes, it's, it's over a hundred years ago, but, but we have never forgotten this red Canadian injustice, this uh, stolen property, this lost labor must and will be repaid. Simply put, it's a debt a debt that we demand in the form of monetary reparations for slavery. Confederate reconstruction efforts were curtailed by the ongoing conflict with the Plains Indians. Land hungry pioneers, gold prospectors, and expanding railroads wanted to move from the bustling south into the Great Plains. The Indians would have to be eliminated. The government and their church leaders instructed that, quote, the great spirit gave the white man the book, the red man the arrow, and the black man the hoe. They took our children from us. Children were forcibly removed and sent to boarding schools. These boarding schools were nothing more than total institutions for the complete eradication of their native heritage and pride. One of my elders once told me, I've observed the red man try to be a white man and I've seen many brown, black, and yellow men try the same. But he said, no one can play the white man like a white man. The Plains Indian Wars would last nearly 30 years. By 1890, the last Indian nation had been defeated by the CS Cavalry. In California, thousands of Chinese immigrants were employed as cheap labor constructing the nation's new railroad system. They were caught completely off guard when Congress passed the Yellow Peril Mandate. Government agents simply told West Coast employers that the Chinese workers they employed, they now owned. What had been cheap labor became slave labor. One might have thought that the proclamation of that mandate would have effectively halted the influx of all those workers from Asia. <laughs> They just kept right on coming, still believing that jobs and bright futures were there waiting for them. But that mandate effectively changed the face of West Coast slavery from black to yellow. Fearful of further non-white immigration, influential clergyman and author, Reverend Claymore Penn Holmes of New York, urged Congress to ensure the Confederate States would remain a Christian nation. The Christian Reform Act of 1895 outlawed any religion not based on Christianity. After much debate, it was decided the Catholic Church would be considered Christian, but the Jews would be asked to leave. As Davis lay on his deathbed, he literally pleaded with the Congress to revoke the act. He reminded them of the gallant work of his Secretary of State, Judah P. Benjamin, and other Jews who had supported the Confederacy. When uh, young Congressman John Ambrose Fontroy II visited the dying man, Fontroy made the mistake of asserting to Davis that the nation would be better off without those blood-sucking Jews. Davis, for his part, reached out with a frail hand and grabbed young Fontroy by the collar and fairly hissed, don't you ever forget, sir that it was a blood-sucking Jew who saved this country. Well, Benjamin was personally hurt by the act, but the death of Davis did create a provision allowing a small number of Jews to remain on the reservation here on Long Island. While blacks were gaining political support in Canada, in the CSA, North-South relations were being romanticized. The once bloody civil war had become 
civil. Novelists during Reconstruction mended the divide between the two regions. In their books, the aims and causes of the war suddenly changed. Slavery is no longer mentioned as the cause of the war. This is key to reconciliation. Thus, the suffering of slaves is ignored. We are presented with only loyal black servants. However, the courage and sacrifice of whites on both sides of the Mason-Dixon line is romantically examined. They struggle to survive. They protect their homes and families. Generals and battlefields take on a new flair. Their smallest details become dramatically important. In bestsellers like My Union Soldier and Of Bells and Blue, Southerners are taught to pity the North, to cry for the lost cause of the Union, the misguided attempt to free the slaves. Northerners are presented as a valiant people who once ruled a mighty land that simply lost its way. The most popular of these works of Reconstructionism is A Northern Wind. Recently, the play had a successful revival on Broadway. I don't know how to thank you, Miss Violet. You tended my wounds. You brought me back from death's door. And though we shall lose this war, my heart will be here with you always. When my husband died in Antietam, I said I'd die, I'd just die, before I'd even speak to another Yankee. But you, you have had an effect on me, sir. I shall never, never be the same. I must go. No! Who are you, my little soldier blue? And though I hate you so, I will never let you go. You try to take my black. I try to take your blacks. But I must have you back. For we are lovers, we are lovers, underneath the same flag. With reconstruction complete, the CSA, inspired by the empires of Britain and France, were anxious to embark on a journey to become the most powerful empire in the world. Do you know someone of questionable racial identity? A neighbor? Someone at work? Contact the Office of Racial Identity at 1-800-555-PASS. You might be eligible for a cash reward. That's right. Passing. Can you stand it, boss? Can you take all oh, dim microscopic shiners gleaming your teeth is? Go now. That's it. All right. Now that's the power of ducky. Mmm, ducky. For a shine that's in the summer of 1900, Confederate framers act on their vision of a lush, productive superstate. They would civilize the savage regions of the Southern Hemisphere. Well, it was called a, a splendid little war, but it was. It really became the first opportunity to test uh, North-South unity against a foreigner, a non-American, and a foe of color, uh, Spanish. The war was a rousing, unifying success. With decisive victories against the Spanish in Cuba and in the Caribbean, the expansion continued into Mexico. These Latin American countries as Confederate satellites were organized along grand antebellum lines with marvelous slave-based plantation economies. Of course, only, only white people could hold Negro slaves, 
But in Mexico, uh, the Mexicans themselves were never subjected to slavery as such. There, they, they had a system that was implemented called a pot, which separated the Mexican people from the white Americans who now rule the country. This system of apartness effectively created two worlds, one white and the other Mexican, separate and unequal. The system did have the advantage of allowing the Mexicans the convenience of knowing their place and staying in it. Los Estados Confederados eh, utilizaron las divisiones raciales y económicas de Sudamérica para crearse aliados militares. En competencia con los británicos y franceses, utilizaron a dictadores corruptos para derrocar a varios líderes elegidos democráticamente. Eh, así, por ejemplo, Brasil atacó a la Argentina, Chile se enfrentó a Bolivia y así sucesivamente. Mm. Podríamos decir que era una estrategia simplemente de dividir y conquistar. Confederate leadership saw the conquest of South America as its prized peace. Conquering a huge landmass would make it a true empire. Bueno, mis padres huyeron de Sudamérica cuando yo era muy joven. Pero, sin embargo, tengo un recuerdo muy vívido de esa época, sobre todo por la comida porque ellos creían en conquistar la mente, pero también el estómago. Así que muy pronto la dieta latinoamericana fue cambiando. Por ejemplo, para el desayuno nos daban grits y sausage, que es como un salchicha. Para la comida era ham hocks y collard greens. Y para el almuerzo, un sándwich de pata de cerdo que llamaban pickle pig food. Eh, me acuerdo que una vez el rector de mi colegio me obligó a comer chitlings. Creí que me iba a morir. The critical mistake Confederate leaders made was in underestimating the will of the South American people to remain free. Our boys hadn't died in such large numbers since the Civil War. I recall a story of a young boy lying in a hospital having lost both his legs in the jungles of Guatemala. And one day when a general was visiting the wounded, He stopped by the boy's bed, and the young man, disillusioned that he was, rather plaintively looked up at the general and said, Why? Why, general? And the general looked at the young man and said, Son, it's because we are Americans. The high personal cost of the expansion was the subject of the 1940 award-winning film, The Dark Jungle. Have you heard? It's on the table, Sergeant. All of them? Every single last one of them. Good Lord. Was it worth it, Sergeant? Was it worth the lives of Cliff and Johnny and Biff? man is the whole world red black brown and yellow they'll always have numbers lieutenant i don't know much but i know this this world is made for the god fearing to use as we see fit For a while, these savages call it theirs, but they're just renting it. It's ours. It was always ours. We just ain't claimed it all yet. Kill them all. And let God sort them out. The costly victory in South America instilled an even deeper belief in Manifest Destiny. They now truly believed they were on a divinely ordained quest for world domination. Well, I'm 
aren't you afraid he'll get away? Heaven, no, not with the shackle. Introducing the shackle, the revolutionary new way of servant monitoring. Just place the shackle around his or her wrist, and when your property strays from your designated area, in minutes, the authorities have your chattel in custody. The secret? Inside the shackle is a space-age computer monitoring chip, allowing the police to track your slippery buck on radar. In no time, he's back home in his cabin. Made of lightweight aluminum alloys, the shackle won't weight your uncle down like old-fashioned chains. And it's tough. The shackle will stand up to the most strenuous of escape attempts. It's unbreakable. It comes in a variety of of sizes, perfect for children, and at the low, low price of $49.95. Why wait? Step into the 21st century. Get the shackle. Aren't you going to stay for coffee? Can't. Gotta get the shackle. Have your credit card ready or send $49.95 check or money order to the shackle. The shackle keeps them in line every time. Operators are standing by. Down home. At the cool chicken inn, we aim to please. The best 100% mammy-made family-style meals. You can taste the love. I like the white meats. I'm a press man. We, we just, just love, love it here. here. You'll just keep hollering, gal, fetch me some more. Look for that wide mouth coon near you. Coon chicken. By 1929, Mexico, Central America, South America, Haiti, and the Caribbean were all members of the growing Confederate Empire. However, the quick expansion would cost even more. The Wall Street crash would devastate the financial community. People lost entire fortunes overnight. The nation retreated into isolationism in an attempt to solve its domestic woes. Grandfather taught us that uh, when you're when you're caught in a dire situation, when you're, when you're cornered, you don't simply fall on your sword. You find a way. He found a way. It's relocation time as Senator John Ambrose Fontroy II launches thousands of processed slaves for assignment overseas trained and ready for travel, whether it be to the now southern Mexico or the Confederate Islands. These darkies are anxious to get to work. They know their place and have their minds right. Yaza, boss! Bon voyage to all those happy mammies and uncles. Good luck. The CSA acted as middleman in the new slave trade, capturing and training slaves for export. Some slaves were chosen domestically, from the poor of their own country, but traditional African slaves were always preferred. The selling of the American way elevated the CSA out of the Depression. This was made possible through the cooperation of African leaders. Africa is a strange and backward continent. The world must understand that captivity is good for the African. He's better off with you than with us. We only secure and trade the inferior tribes, only those with whom we have long-standing conflicts. Of course, we have conflicts with most tribes. <laughs> but for our cooperation, America allows us to govern our people. They leave us alone, they believe in democracy, and so do we. Critics often wonder how Africans involved in the trade can market other black people. They say, you should stick together. You are human beings, and you should help one another. To this, I simply must say, no. Capitalism is no respecter of persons. There's simply too much to be gained. A good chief, like a good congressman, senator, or president, always puts the prosperity of his people first. In Europe, the rise of Nazi Germany was of little concern to the Confederate States and its isolationist foreign policy. 
Many Confederate leaders visited Germany and attended the mass Nazi rallies. Congress officially supported Germany's new Aryan racial policies, calling them biologically correct. Hitler returned the visit in the spring of 1935, touring the boroughs of New York City. Although protested by Jewish Americans, the trip was a resounding success. In Washington, Hitler proposed that America join with him in a final solution to the problem of inferior races. Hitler's plan was to exterminate the Jews of Europe and create a pure Aryan continent. Secretary of State John Ambrose Fauntroy III responded by suggesting that Germany not exterminate Jewish citizens, but instead use them as a productive slave labour force. Taking Hitler on a tour of American slave labour plantations and factories, Fauntroy and Hitler discussed the possibilities. No agreement was reached, but Secretary Fauntroy made it clear the CS felt it immoral to waste human livestock, but promised not to intervene in any military conflict Germany had with its neighbours. America did have a new enemy. Japan had become expansionist, assembling a large military force. For the CSA, they posed a threat to the entire Pacific region. The Confederate States would act. On the morning of December the 7th, 1941, America struck Japan in a devastating surprise attack. The airbase on the Corel Islands, the Japanese naval fleet anchored in Tokyo Bay, and the former capital of Kyoto were all heavily damaged by Confederate bombers. The war with Japan had begun. Because the Japanese people were small in physical stature and non-white, Confederate leaders dismissed them as weak. Once again, they underestimated the will of a foreign power. They would find out just how weak they were. So many men were dying in the war that Confederate leaders turned to their slaves for assistance. The first to volunteer were West Coast enslaved Japanese, anxious to prove their loyalty and perhaps gain their freedom. However, Congress decided they were sneaky and could not be trusted. They were banned from service. A regiment of slaves, the 129th Fighting Bucks, were leased by their owners to the Confederate armed forces to serve in combat. The slaves were promised their freedom if they would fight. The men of the 129th fought with distinction and courage. They were given the most dangerous missions and casualties were very high, but they earned the respect of their Confederate officers. Even after suffering such tremendous losses, the Japanese forces still would just not surrender. And then by the grace of God, we developed a weapon that would put the entire foreign world of colors in their place. The war was over, and it was a time for immense celebration. However, after the war, the 129th Fighting Bucks were returned to their masters for enslavement. No explanation was given. Servants' etiquette and proper table linens for formal dinner parties, how to be the belle of the ball, and what to look for when buying a Chinese gardener on the next Better Homes and Plantations. It's a good thing. I just gave this place a good scrubbing, but everything is still dull as dishwater. Miss Ann's gonna fret something fierce. Hi. Who is y'all? I'm Goldie. I'm Dusty. We're the Gold Dust Twins. Are you a slave to housework? Let the Gold Dust Twins emancipate you from the burdens of cleaning. It gets everything shining like new. Thank you, Goldie and Dusty. In 1950, the Confederate States were enjoying a period of domestic tranquility. Antebellum values were at the core of this peace. Slaves had been beaten into submission. 
the future was rich with promise. Then it happened. The Canadian-based John Brown Underground, or the JBU, a splinter group of the NAACP, waged what they called a war against slavery. While the NAACP practiced non-violence, the JBU employed any means necessary. The JBU were terrorists, pure and simple, bent on the destruction of the nation of the Confederacy. What is terrorism to one is patriotism to another. The CSA sent Ambassador Hamish Bond to visit Canadian Prime Minister Louis S. Saint Laurent of the Liberal Party. Bond demanded the extradition of all members of the JBU. Prime Minister Saint Laurent refused. Canadian abolitionism had now become the major threat to the Confederate way of life. They, they just had to be stopped. The Abbey wants to make the world a race of mulattoes, half mule, half horse. Remain pure, friends. Beware of the abolitionist propaganda. Beware of the abolitionist saboteurs. Keep your eyes open. Your neighbor could be an Abbey. Bill? Dear? What are you doing down here in the basement? In the dark? You're not the same anymore. I don't know you, honey. You're so cold and distant. Do you still love me? That's not it. But then are you sick, dear? Do we need to see a doctor? I don't know what to do. Talk to me. What is there to say? I found these in your room. The Confessions of Nat Turner. The Life and Times of Frederick Douglass. Uncle Tom's Cabin! What are you doing with these? If you must know, I read them. I'm an abolitionist. To safeguard against red Canadian aggression, the CSA constructed a wall spanning the entire length of the Canadian border. Called the Cotton Curtain, it is fortified and impregnable. Radio Free Confederacy sends broadcasts over the wall every day with the hope that slaves will hear the transmissions and gain information about their lives. The triumph of the Cotton Curtain would serve to increase violent attacks against the CSA. Yeah, I, uh, I was seven years old when, when Dad was assassinated. And, well, the president, he, he launched uh, airstrikes against Canada, but I have to be honest with you, it doesn't really ease the pain in uh, losing a father. After America's neutrality during the Second World War in Europe, Britain and France joined other summit nations in calling for sanctions against the CS. The summit nations imposed a world embargo against the Confederate States. Any notion of a war with Canada was dismissed. The CS retreated into isolation. There was rationing. Only the nation of South Africa remained a loyal ally. The success of the embargo would lead many to quietly question, is it worth it?
ball out here means more than corralling a young buck. It's a time of crisp, clean morning air, and the sound, thundering stampede. It's a time when horses come down from the high pasture, and a man prepares for another tough winter. It's time for a nigger hair, an American cigarette. The candidates need no introduction. The Democratic candidate, Vice President Richard M. Nixon, and the Republican candidate, Senator John F. Kennedy. And now for the first opening statement by Senator John F. Kennedy. In the election of 1960, and with the world around us, the question is whether the world will exist, half slave or half free, whether it will move in the direction of freedom, in the direction of the road that we are taking, or whether it will move in the direction of slavery. If we do well here, if we meet our obligations, if we're moving ahead, then I think freedom will be secure around the world. If we fail, then freedom fails. It was what many had predicted of an Irish Catholic and a Northerner to boot. Critics had called Kennedy a black Republican, obviously bringing up the image of Abraham Lincoln and, and the abolitionists of the past. Slaves knew Kennedy was sympathetic to their plight. He could not directly come out and advocate its end, but everyone knew that if the opportunity arose, Kennedy would emancipate. It was 1960. President-elect Kennedy, the youngest leader in American history, and the first president from the North since the War of Northern Aggression, would dramatically alter the direction of the country. What Kennedy termed a new frontier. Polls indicated that only 29% of the population now favored slavery, the lowest figures ever. Kennedy, young, intelligent, and too clever by half symbolized this. He had skillfully managed to put a handsome face on emancipation. However, Kennedy, distracted by the Cold War with Canada and an expansionist campaign in Southeast Asia, had little time to address the revolutionary social changes at home. Women now demanded an end to the sexual relations between their master husbands and their female slaves. For generations, they had tolerated these unions and the slave children they produced. Fully 50 years after the efforts of Susan B. Anthony, women now wanted control over their lives. We are not frail, simple-minded pets. Right. We are more, much, much more. We demand the right to be women, women with the future, women with the vote. Confederate teenagers were being influenced by the beast of Negro rock and roll blasting across the cotton curtain from Canada. Free to express themselves, former slaves enriched Canadian culture. Performers like Elvis Presley imitated black artists and were censored and arrested. This Elvis Presley and this Canadian abolitionist-inspired rock and roll music threatens to deflower every pure white child in this great country of ours. Many like Presley took their talents north and became stars in Canada. Canadian writers like Richard Wright and James Baldwin created masterworks of literature. The ban on race, music, literature and art stifled American creativity. Prohibition of certain abolitionist and Negro-inspired art left Confederate culture void and without conscience. American art never evolved beyond government-inspired propaganda. Negroes, afforded equal education, excelled in all areas of Canadian life. In the world of sports, they helped Canada to consistently defeat America in the Olympic Games, winning hundreds of gold medals. After seeing great black athletes in the Olympics, some Confederates pondered the inclusion of slaves in sport. In the first annual CSFL championship game, two all-white teams, the Washington Indians and the New York Niggers, illustrated the call to break the color barrier and emancipate. 100 years ago today, Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. He thereby began the process 
to fulfill finally the promises of the Declaration of Independence. The centuries since have seen the struggle to convert freedom from rhetoric to reality. It has been, in many respects, a somber story, and the task is not finished. Much remains to be done to eradicate the evil of human slavery. The proclamation must be regarded not as an end, but a beginning. In giving freedom to the slave, we assure freedom to the free. In giving rights to others which belong to them, we give rights to ourselves and to our country. The president's assassination drained the lifeblood from the entire nation. The belief some white citizens had for a new America was gone. Women would not get the vote. The hope slaves had for their freedom exploded into rage. Two major slave rebellions, one in the Los Angeles, California section of Watts and the other in Newark, New Jersey, caused strong but divided reactions from Confederate lawmakers. In the wake of our late president, our nation is at the crossroads. We must ask the question, is slaveocracy the only way? Like most owners, I love my servants and hate when I have to punish them. My wife and my children hate it. The young people of this country hate it. It is time for change. We have to stop pussyfooting around. We have a war going on in Vietnam and another one erupting right here in our own country. Now, unless we plan on losing both these wars, we better stop crying for these gooks and these darkies and lay the hammer down. We have never lost a war, and by God, I'm not about to lose this one. By the mid-1970s, the social revolution had been crushed. Most of the opposition leaders fled the country, went into hiding, or were killed. The nation seemed to be caught up in some kind of malaise. Many feared that we were crumbling from within and that the, the best years of the Confederate States of America were behind us. This is Newsbreak. I'm Jeb Boone. Confederate Express, the nation's leading shipper, issued a warning today that house servants are using the service to, in their words, overnight themselves to freedom. There was this one fella who shipped his whole family, wife and two kids, up north in a box labeled Home Entertainment Center. Another big tip, check for air holes. Back after this. These are the faces of Contrary. With Contrary, one little blue pill gives all day control. Side effects may include vomiting, shortness of breath, nausea, blurred vision, liver and kidney problems, constipation, and anal bleeding. Contrary has been known to cause heart attack in some old uncles. Contrary is not meant for servants who are nursing or about to drop a litter. Ask your veterinarian about Contrary today. Officials in Washington suggested charges may be filed following several controversial errors in the Department of Racial Identity. The watchdog group, Proven White, charged that DNA mistakes are commonplace and that many people don't know who they are. The search for Big Sam expanded the Chicago area today. The runaway remains number one on the CBI's most wanted list. A spokesman for the Bureau indicated, although the crime is over two years old, Big Sam is still believed the JBU mastermind behind the now infamous One Drop scandal. And on a program note, be sure to stay tuned for the live death row execution of Floyd Ray Hubbard. Now that's at 12, 11 Central. See you then. After sponsoring the popular Family Values Act, John Ambrose Fauntroy V was selected to head the Commerce Department. 
he would steer the Family Values Initiative. Fauntroy utilized popular religious leaders in a series of infomercials, answering the nation's difficult moral questions. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5. Slaves, be obedient to your human masters with fear and trembling and sincerity of heart as to Christ, not only when being watched as if seeking favor, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. Amen. Fauntroy brought slave training out of the Dark Ages, utilizing the latest multimedia technology. I'm gonna run off. Now, show is, he running tonight. Delilah has just learned that Ike is planning to escape. Escape attempts are costly and disruptive. How will Delilah handle it? Doesn't he know how good we have it here? Good food, a roof over my head? And a kind master? Don't be afraid to learn more. Be Massa's ear. Is he still talking that abolition talk? Bingo. Delilah has discovered that Ike's mind ain't right. Critical information. Delilah's next move? Go tell it. Yes, sir, master. I could plan him to run off tonight. I thought you should know. Thank you, Delilah. I'm glad you shared this information with me. You know, Delilah, you are a good one. Like Delilah, you too can be a good one. Fauntroy's new agencies were designed to monitor and correct the American fabric. When he stays out all night or gives you a fatherly smack, remember, he's the master of the house. And as such, he will always exercise his will with fairness and truthfulness. I'm here to speak to you about an important medical problem. Are you now, or have you ever been, a homosexual? And we've encouraged Hollywood to create more shows like uh, That's My Boy. You can't help but laugh at Cleophus. Follow the antics of America's favorite jigaboo, Cleophus, as he deals with the challenge of freedom on That's My Boy, weeknights at 6.30. That's just me, boss. That's my boy. Well, Look at the Slave Shopping Network. The Slave Shopping Network alone has done wonders to bring back the joys of uh, Negro ownership. Let's talk slaves. For the next hour, I am here with Joyce, and she has brought us some of the most incredible servants to pick from today. That's right, Paula. We have 40 extraordinary Negroes right off the tarmac waiting for you. And I know one of them's just right for you in your home. So let's start with Jupiter and his family. Now, Joyce. You say that Jupiter's a buck for the 90s. That's right, Paula. Versatility is the key with Jupiter. Mm -hmm. He's the perfect slave for home, office, or industry. He's healthy, adaptable, and reliable. Oh, and what about our gal Prissy? Oh, what a find. Well-mannered, loyal, smart, but not uppity. Oh, and what a litter of pickin' she's had. Aren't those two the cutest little things you ever saw? They would be so helpful around the yard or with dinner parties. Now, as with all SSN products, we can either break up Jupiter's family for you, or you can have them as a set. So, let the bidding begin. A new generation of young people are, are excited now about owning Negroes. The uh, buying, trading, and, and selling of servants on the internet has pumped over $500 million into the economy. But behind pornography, it's the top selling item on the net. The 80s, and the early 90s were more than a nostalgia trip. We'd finally put that tragic decade of self-doubt, the 1960s, behind us. I swear I'd, I never had seen so many flags and yellow ribbons as when our boys came home victorious from the Persian Gulf. We'd really whipped those Arabs. We won. That was enough. And once again, we loved ourselves. When this country was the United States, of America. Slaves built this capital. Washington and Davis, Today, they made our empire we preserve it. Reports soon surfaced. Fauntroy would run for the Democratic presidential nomination.
This is John Ambrose Fauntroy, and I approve this message. After numerous requests to the State Department, Senator Fauntroy intervened and personally arranged for an interview with a slave living in the CS. He told us, we have nothing to hide. Right, right. No contact, Unfortunately, the slaves we were offered had clearly received training for the interview, corrupting any natural response to our questions and rendering their responses manufactured. However, through clandestine means, we received a note. Uh, no contact, all right? All right. This note would change the course of American history. The note instructed us to meet our source on a country estate in rural Virginia. The note was simply signed, John Brown. Get out and follow me. Don't kill me, sure shoot me. But I don't care no more. I got to say this. What do you have to say? Master Pomeroy, his family, and my family. What? See, long while back, my great great grandmammy and his great granddaddy, they, you know. I don't understand. I... Me and me and Pop Boy, we can. Related? How? Pop Roy's white. Just because he look white don't mean he all white. See, years ago, when, when all this started, they took the light ones into the Fontroy family and made them white. Us dark ones got cast out, left for niggas. He got the jungle blood. Believe me, he got the jungle blood in him, and he know it, too. Following the release of that tape, Fauntroy held a news conference to respond to the charges of Negroness. These accusations leveled against me by a slave, no less, are false. My great-granddaddy did not have sexual relations with that woman. I am 100% Caucasian. 100%. Um, will you submit to a DNA test? No. No, I will not be subjected to such treatment, nor will I allow my family to be subjected to such ridicule. You believe the Republican Party arranged for the slave to make these allegations? Certainly. Now, now look, this doc is obviously being used in an attempt to derail my campaign. Now, now, let me just say this. The American people know that John Ambrose Fauntroy has their best interest in mind. They know me. They know my family. These. These dirty tricks will not stop our message. We will win in November. Rumors are circulating that you may be called before the House Committee on Racial Identity. It's subpoenaed when you appear. Well, I, uh, I'll just cross that bridge when I, when I come to it. Thank you. The racial allegation against Fauntroy would cost him the election in November. On December the 12th, the body of John Ambrose Fauntroy V was found in the grounds of his suburban Virginia estate. The coroner attributed his death 
to a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. <laughs> DNA test results, ordered by the House Committee on Racial Identity, were released days later. The results proved negative. I only wish that our dear family friend, uh, Chancellor Hitler, had lived to see how he empowered his country. Imagine an America where everyone has the same deep abiding pride of Aryan birth. I want to reclaim that heritage. With America's help, we can. No slavery in history has been as devastating as chattel slavery in the Americas. Nowhere else were slaves taught that they were not part of the human family. This has wounded the African as nothing else could. It still haunts slaves and former slaves today. It's important to remember that our fond attachment to slavery uh, is not an economic necessity. In fact, it's always been detrimental to the Confederate economy to hold slaves. Yet, slavery, like nothing else, is what defines us, shapes us as a people, as a nation. Owning a slave is a constant reminder of who you are. It strengthens our role and responsibility to be a leader in our homes, in our families, and in our communities, and to provide the leadership as only a white man could hold in the most powerful nation in the world. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the Confederate States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all, white people.
Run for run for the battery will get you. Run for run and the sound won't stay. What you gonna do? What you gonna do? What you gonna do when we find you? What you gonna do? What you gonna do? What you gonna do when we find you? Run for run for the battery will get you. Run for run or you gotta get away. Run for run or the battery will get you. Run for run and the sound won't stay. What you gonna do? What you gonna do? What you gonna do when we find you? What you gonna do? What you gonna do? What you gonna do when we find you? Run for run. We are a friendly people. We value God's great plan, though some say our ways are wrong. Washington and Davis, they made our empire grand. Others would destroy it, but Fauntroy has the plan. Strong and- 